few years ago, the best means available for reaching a forest fire in roadless and trailless factory was by man on foot. Weary from miles of cross-country travel, the smoke chaser had the back-breaking job of putting out the fire after he got there. Although horse-drawn transportation to the back country was replaced by the faster motor vehicle over new forest roads, it provided speedier travel only to certain destinations. And at the end of the road, the firefighter still had to take to the brush for the final stage of his journey. In fighting forest fires, time is precious. Even the fastest combination of vehicle, horse, and foot travel permitted small fires to gain momentum and become conflagrations before they could be reached and controlled. Then in 1940 came the smoke jumpers. Now the firefighter has a chance in his race against time to corral the fast-moving fire demon. Started as an experiment a few years ago, the project has sustained a steady growth along with perfected techniques, followed by increasingly satisfactory results. Now it is regarded as an important and highly effective means of getting action in the back country of three forest service regions. It requires a lot of know-how and physical stamina to be a smoke jumper. On actual training jumps, the instructor is with the beginner through the use of a directional public address system and is able to instruct the jumper while in the air. The trainee must be conditioned for jumps into rugged timbered wilderness to put out fires and then hike out 20 or 30 miles. He must be trained to maneuver his parachute to suitable landing spots. After applicants have been screened according to certain mental and physical standards, they attend classes at a training camp. This is the period for indoctrination and the training curriculum, safety codes and standards are explained. There are lectures on theory and the history of parachuting with demonstrations of the type of parachutes used. The instructor describes a standard 28-foot flat type parachute canopy, so-called because the silk or nylon forms a 28-foot circle. The seven-foot openings in the canopy are steering slots, and air jetting from them gives the chute forward motion. The jumper can control the direction of air flow by pulling the guide lines, thereby maneuvering the canopy in any direction. Usually in groups of 10 headed by a squad leader, the smoke jumpers are issued equipment in seamless sacks. Each is responsible for his outfit. Let's examine these items. First, the abdominal support. It covers and protects the lower abdomen and provides the necessary support during the opening shock of the parachute. It is made to be worn snugly and low in front. Next comes the coat, padded at elbows and shoulders and made of durable canvas. The high, stiff collar provides protection against snags and limbs in tree landings. The pants are pulled on like an ordinary pair of overalls and the heavy elastic suspenders are adjusted to the individual. Cut high at the waist, the pants provide plenty of protection to the body in rough landings. Designed for fast removal, the point of release is conveniently located on the center fly strip. Note that plenty of felt padding is stitched at the knees, at the seat, and down along the inside of the pants. These are considered the points of contact in rough landings. The protective webbing is another important safety feature. Giving ample protection at the crotch, the heavy webbing runs from the outside of each ankle and up the inner part of the legs. This webbing can be adjusted by the buckles at the ankles to provide perfect fit to the individual. This demonstration gives an idea of the effectiveness of the strap for jumpers landing astride tree limbs and other obstacles. The large pocket on the right trouser leg carries the letdown rope 
carefully arranged in a fireman's bird nest coil to prevent snarling in the tree letdown. This pocket also carries two 12-foot yellow streamers used for signaling from the ground to the airplane. They are an essential part of the smoke jumper's equipment. Actual tests have shown that yellow can be seen more plainly from the air than any other color. A strong cord is now used when closed the pocket to keep the contents from falling out while the jumper is in the air or landing. This long cord end within easy reach readily unties the slip knot. Next comes the harness. It is a single point release type adapted to smoke jumping. The strong construction and simplicity of design meets the many requirements associated with the smoke jumper's work. Adjustments are necessary to each individual to provide a snug fitting harness, but at the same time give freedom of action for the arms and body. The heavy webbing and hardware of the harness have a high safety factor and are designed to distribute the opening shock over the jumper's body and provide a comfortable swing. These snaps at the shoulders are for attaching the backpack parachute risers. And in front, these snaps are for the risers of the emergency pack. Lower down, the black smaller ones support the weight of the emergency chute. The disc on the single point release mechanism may be turned, but it remains locked until the safety clip is removed. Now strike the disc and the release connections fall apart. It's fast, yet safe. But remember, the clip must be removed before the assembly can be unlocked. Obviously, practice sessions are necessary. We are now ready to attach the main backpack parachute. This adjustable belly band is passed under the harness member like this and buckled tightly in front. The end of the strap is turned back through the buckle for fast removal. After risers are fastened to harness snaps, a bent key is inserted through a hole in the tongue of the snap. Now the snaps cannot open accidentally. As previously pointed out, the emergency chest pack is first fastened to the lower snaps. These support the weight of the pack only. The risers or lift webs of the emergency chute are attached to the larger snaps above. On top of the emergency chute is a knife, easily accessible to either hand should it be needed to cut entangled parachute lines. Both parachutes are now on. Before climbing into the airplane, the end of the static line from the backpack is passed over the shoulder to where it is easily accessible to the jumper for snapping onto the static line cable in the airplane. The static line eliminates the use of the manually operated ripcord. To illustrate, let's assume that we are snapping the static line to the cable in the airplane. The man jumps and the thread that laces the cover to the backpack tray is broken by the tension of the static line. All thread connections are broken immediately. The tension on the static line pulls the cover off the backpack assembly. As the jumper falls away from the airplane, the canopy, which is tied to the cover with a brake cord, is pulled out. However, this cord does not break until the lines, as well as the canopy, are completely strung out. The lines are held securely in place on the tray by retainer loops, which prevent any possible chance of their becoming entangled. The temporary tacking between risers and tray are broken when the canopy opens. The brake cord snaps after the chute becomes fully strung out with the weight of the jumper. Leaving the canopy cover and static line with the airplane. Should anything go wrong, the jumper has the emergency chute in reserve, which can be manually operated with either hand. Another type of parachute is worn by the spotter or jump master. It is commonly called the spotter's backpack. In putting this parachute on, the shoulder straps and risers are grasped from the inside like this. 
then swung around onto the back. After the chest snap is fastened, lean over and slide the seat sling into place, and then fasten the leg snaps. This parachute, which is light, flexible, and comfortable to wear, is for emergency use only. When making a jump, clear the ship, grasp the ripcord handle, and pull. This is a 24-foot seat pack, usually worn by pilots or non-active personnel accompanying the jumpers. It is put on in the same manner as the spotter's backpack. It provides a seat cushion and is manually operated. Now let's go back to the dressing up. For the protection of head and face, a regulation football helmet is used with a mask attached. The mask covering the face is of welded steel mesh hinged at the top. Two leather straps fasten into buckles on either side holding the mask tightly and securely over the jumper's face. A sponge rubber pad attached to the inside of the mask fits over the chin. This assures plenty of protection against head or face injury due to rough landing. Soft, close-fitting gloves are worn by the jumper to prevent hand burns caused by lines slipping through the hands while maneuvering the parachute. Also, good foot protection is needed while jumping and working on fires. These are logger-type boots with composition soles. Caulked soles are likely to cause ankle injuries on landing and are never worn. And so ends the dressing up, and we have a smart-looking outfit. Every item is inspected before the man jumps. Special attention is given to the ripcord assembly on the emergency chute, and the backpack cover lacings and harness fitting. Yet all this can be accomplished with care and accuracy in a few seconds. Firefighting, the principal job of the smoke jumpers, requires that good, sharp tools be always ready. Fire packs, which are numbered and assigned to the men, include only the most essential equipment for work and for subsistence. A canteen and a canvas case containing notebook, map, and compass are tied on the outside of the pack, readily available to the jumper on landing. All items in the pack are inspected and checked before being issued to the jumper. Here is a canvas two-gallon water bag and the important lightweight short-handled fire shovel. A heavy-duty flashlight for night work and for night travel. Enough rations to last each man at least two days, which meets most requirements on small fires. In this compact package are cooking utensils and dishes for emergency use. A first aid kit with essential medicine. And last, of equal importance with a shovel, is the dual purpose Pulaski fire tool for cutting and grubbing. It is found in every fireman's pack. Fire packs are dropped in pairs hooked together by rings and snaps. This combination will support the most delicate cargo for dropping, as sleeping bags in a sack are used under the packs to absorb the landing shock. A two-way contact radio weighing 22 pounds may be dropped in this manner by placing it on top of the sleeping bag in a seamless sack and secured between the two fire packs. This sensitive equipment invariably lands in good condition and ready for use. A large chute, usually a 24 or 28 foot silk or nylon canopy, is used for dropping this important cargo. It is operated by a static line and fastened to the load with webbing slings. After the load lands, the lines are taken up and the chute container, which goes down with the load, is made larger by pulling out this false top. This provides ample storage for the canopy and lines until time for repacking. For retrieving shoots hung up in trees, this pruning saw comes in mighty handy. The teeth are set to cut only on the pull stroke. A cross-cut saw can be dropped with a load in this manner and is included when warranted by conditions on the fire. A 
A smaller 14-foot canopy, which will carry up to 70 pounds, may be used for ordinary fire tools not easily damaged in landing. This cargo chute, also operated by static line, is called the flare chute. The assembly is light in weight and compact in size. A spare cross-cut saw, protected by boards, is always carried in the airplane. If requested by signal from the jumpers on the ground, it can be dropped in a free fall and located by the long yellow streamers. When dropping on rocky terrain, this small three-foot muslin chute is used to slow down the rate of descent. Tree climbers with a streamer attached are dropped free fall when needed to remove cargoes or canopies from trees. Covered by rubber shields, the spurs are protected against damage in landing. This is a five gallon canvas water bag with shoulder straps, designed to be worn like a backpack. The pump with hose attachment works with the bag and is used for cooling hot spots and for mop-up work. For greater safety and efficiency, the smoke jumper's equipment is undergoing constant study, experimentation, and change. The firefighter might never make a water landing, but just in case of such emergency, experiments were made to provide adequate equipment to keep the man afloat and to adopt training procedures to rid the jumper of heavy gear while in the water enabling him to reach land in safety. Other experiments are in progress, aimed at safeguarding the jumpers against special hazards and making their work more effective. While such experiments are progressing, fires must be attacked as quickly as possible in the most remote regions by trained firefighters. The airplane and the parachute are means of faster transportation not only for the firefighter, but also for supplies and equipment to fire camps. The airborne firefighter is a reflection of modern progress in transportation, but this method is merely a means to an end. After all, the important job is to put out the fire. Jumping looks easy. All you dip out, float down like a feather, and land like a ballet dancer. Well, not exactly. Bruises, sprains, and fractures from landing would be common if it were not for protective clothing. The jumper's excellent physical condition and training are equally important. And conditioning starts here. Morning exercises remove muscle kinks. No loafing, no lost motion. The first real jump. Next comes the obstacle course. Here's where physical stamina and body coordination are on trial. Over the high ramp, hit the ground and roll Thanks. The roll absorbs the shock. This climb conditions the arms and shoulders for maneuvering the parachute in the air. Then the forward somersault on the net and regain the feet. A good timing practice. Now another ground roll. Running the V trough strengthens the legs and ankles for landing on rough ground. Halfway around and no time for a second wind. The run is completed in one sweep. The overhead ladder provides more exercise for shoulders and arms. Not as easy as it appears. Now the alternate holds. Approach the obstacle at full speed and retain your balance conditioning for rough landings. Crawl through these pipes and put unused muscles to work in tight quarters. The last obstacle on the run, over the low ramp and another ground roll. Who said parachute jumping was easy? That is not all, says the instructor. Before regaining the equilibrium, the torture rack is introduced most ingenious device, to say the least. With toes snug against the plank, wrap the two straps around the calf of the legs, 
like this. Each man makes sure that his straps are secure. It is important, as you will see. Bend backwards until the head touches the ground. Easy going down, but not so easy coming up. There will be kinks in the spinal cult, unwilling muscles, especially in the legs and stomach. The exercise will reduce any overstuffed waistline. An hour's work each day on the obstacle course and the torture rack is plenty. The aim is to constantly push, but never strain the endurance. With hands on risers, the jumper comes in for a landing. The instant his feet touch the ground, he makes a half body turn does a complete backward roll. This is important, so let's repeat. To get the last bit of lift from the canopy, always hang on to the risers. The knees bend in a half body turn for the backward roll in one smooth motion. Many practice sessions are necessary before the jumper does this roll automatically and without effort. It calls for perfect timing and body coordination. In boxing, such a maneuver would be called rolling with a punch to absorb the blow. Smooth backward ground roll, shown, reduces the landing shock on the feet and ankles and distributes it more evenly over the body. This roll, however, is not always possible, especially on rough ground where brush and other obstacles cannot be avoided. But regardless of landing conditions, the jumper must not attempt a stand-up landing. Any kind of roll is better than that and will pay big dividends in preventing injuries. The jumps from high and low ramps on the obstacle course provide practice in timing the roll when the feet touch the ground. Timing is important. Constant practice is a requirement. When properly accomplished, the backward ground roll is a product of the perfect timing and body coordination essential in all landings. Handicapped to some extent by wearing the regulation suit, the trainee should practice the backward roll to get the feel of protective clothing used in actual jumping. On this rope swing, the protective clothing comes in mighty handy. The swing provides a landing shock that must be followed by the roll. It also gives the trainee experience in making landings with varying wind drifts and velocities. Frequently, a jumper hangs up in a tree. These are called feather bed landings because the branches break the fall and absorb the landing shock. Once in a tree, he can descend in safety by using the letdown rope by following simple letdown procedures. Here is where this training starts. Suspended from an overhead cable and suited up in complete jumping equipment, Trainee is taught by experienced instructors how to use the long rope for his letdown. Starting close to the ground, the beginner first unties the cord around the leg pocket and pulls out approximately 10 feet of rope for threading. He makes sure there is enough rope. Next, the rope end is passed through both D-rings on the letdown belt and back through the first D-ring again. Then he brings the rope end up through the V-ring of the first riser and across, where it is tied to the V-ring of the second riser. At this point, the jumper should be sure that he has enough slack for three half hitches. Always tie three half hitches as a safety measure. The coiled rope is removed from the leg pocket and dropped. The bayonet fastener is released by a quarter turn and the slack in the back band is pulled around with the left hand. The lower loop of rope threaded between the D-rings is pulled out far enough to go under the heel. This provides friction for the left down. With the rope secured by one hand, pull the safety clasp, turn the disc, and strike it smartly, thus releasing the harness. After the trainee is thoroughly familiar with the letdown procedure, he is pulled up a little higher and practice is continued. 
Remember to pull out about 10 feet of rope from the coil in the leg pocket. Insert the rope end through the first D-ring of the left down belt, then across and through the second D-ring. Now back across through the first one again. Pull out enough slack for the risers. Through the first riser V-ring, across and through the second ring. Be sure enough rope has been pulled out for the necessary three half hitches. After the tie is made, at least a foot of spare rope should be left over. Take up the surplus rope and remove the coil from the leg pocket. The rope is secure, so release the bayonet fastener by a quarter turn, freeing one end of the back band. Now pull the back band around with the left hand. Always put on gloves to avoid rope burns. Now pull out the lower rope between the D-rings and loop it under the heel. Draw it tight and hold it securely. Pull the safety clasp. Turn the disc and strike it to release the harness. The weight is now supported by the rope only. The last stage of the letdown training takes place at a much greater height. Handicapped with full jumping gear, the trainee is suspended 35 feet above the ground. The emergency chute is unfastened on one side and hangs free. The straps holding the mask snug to the chin are unbuckled. and the helmet is removed and hooked to the emergency chute for safekeeping. The coil of rope is left in the leg pocket while the end is pulled out about 10 feet and threaded properly through the two D-rings on the left down belt. Slack is pulled out for the risers. The rope is threaded through the V-rings and made fast with three half hitches. The procedure is exactly the same here as it was at the lower elevations. Now remove the coiled rope and drop it. Release the bayonet fastener by the quarter turn and pull out the back band. Next, take up the slack and loop the lower cross rope under the foot. Remember the gloves which were placed in the helmet where they would be handy. They should always be worn on the letdowns. Be sure to have a good grip on the rope before operating the single point release. Sometimes a little wiggling is necessary to get free from the harness. But this is soon accomplished, and with ease and safety, the descent to the ground is complete. The proper technique for leaving the airplane is now shown with airplane mock-ups. With right foot on the step and hands on the door, arms are folded after jumping to avoid entanglement with suspension lines. The mock-ups are exact dimensions of the airplane fuselage commonly used by the smoke jumpers. This larger one accommodates eight jumpers, the spotter, and their firefighting equipment. Within this limited space and handicapped by complete jumping gear, the trainees must learn to cooperate with each other in these tight quarters. Now to practice the correct takeoff. The signal is given to hook up. Static lines are snapped to the cable. The first man gets down in jumping position. Spotter now directs the flight by hand signals to the pilot. Over a spot selected to compensate for wind drift, he slaps the first man on the back 
and the next two take their positions and follow. On actual jumps, the spotter in the door determines the takeoff point by releasing a drift chute. This chute, by its course of descent, indicates the direction and velocity of wind. After the point of takeoff has been determined, the spotter signals the pilot on the final approach. Cut the motors, slap the first jumper, and out they go. This procedure is practiced until it becomes second nature, hook up, first man in position. Signal the pilot. Cut motors and jump. Similar instructions are given the trainees in the small airplane mock-up and they go through their assigned jobs as if they were actually going to a fire. From this tower, the trainee experiences his first jump into space as a smoke jumper. His first takeoff, however, is from this lower platform to establish takeoff technique and body position. Eventually, he graduates to the high platform. From the top of the tower, the drop simulates an actual parachute jump. The correct takeoff and vertical body position are essential in the tower jump. Attached to the end of this heavy rope, which runs over a pulley, is this single tree and riser arrangement, which will give the jumper the same feeling as being suspended from an open parachute. Before the takeoff, the trainee is instructed to fold his arms in front after jumping. His right foot is placed on the step, which is identical to the step on the airplane. The V-rings on the end of the lift webs or risers are attached to the harness by snaps. With both hands grasping the door, which is similar to the one in the airplane, the jumper receives a slap on the back, the signal to jump. It's done in one smooth motion, body in vertical position. The rope snubs the jumper just short of the safety net, giving a shock similar to the opening of the canopy. Folded arms and vertical body position must become firmly associated with the jump. It must become a habit, the same as the ground roll in landing. Practice is necessary. After a number of tower jumps, the trainee is told to transfer a rock from one hand to the other behind his back and then fold his arms in front. This is done after he jumps. If the trainee can concentrate on the rock transfer and at the same time employ proper jumping position, there is a good chance that he will do well even on his first parachute jump. Primarily, the tower jump gives the beginner confidence in his equipment. It teaches him how to leave the airplane in the correct position and gives him the feel of the harness when the canopy blossoms out in the sky. The important procedures for proper takeoff and the equally important technique for safe parachute landings have been reviewed in this picture. However, the trainee should not forget the physical requirements for the job ahead. The obstacle course provides muscle building exercises and conditions the trainee for the many tests of endurance required in the strenuous job of firefighting, the long hikes from remote forest regions. Sound physical fitness is all important. Body coordination is required for landings. Healthy bodies can take it. Mental and physical alertness is required to maintain proper position and to accomplish a perfect takeoff. Practice does it. Letdowns from tree landings are not difficult. Use your head and follow the simple rule. Remember your trainer's instructions, and from your very first jump on, you will meet the test with confidence.
Okay, number one, turn around. Turn right around, number one. You're going in the wrong direction. Number two, use your right guideline. Come on, number one, turn it around. You're headed in the wrong direction. Number one, you haven't got your guideline. Use your guideline. Turn around. Now that's better. That's much better. Now ride them two front risers. Let's pull them right down. Watch for an opening now. Keep your feet together. Keep your feet together in a nice roll. Yes, remember the instructions. Feet together and roll. Not always this perfect, perhaps, but keep trying. Although good landing technique is important, the main objective in jump training is practice in parachute maneuvers or how to steer the canopy. And for this training, a field marker becomes an important target for which jumpers must steer after leaving the airplane at an elevation of 1,500 feet. Only the essential rudiments of parachute jumping are explained to the new candidates during this short training session, and group instructions are given whenever it is possible in order to save time. However, individual attention is never overlooked when needed. Leaving the airplane and maintaining good body position, as seen in slow motion, is an essential phase of good jumping. It becomes routine procedure. Training starts here, after the chute opens. First, inspect the canopy. Is there a line over? Next, the wind drift. Estimate the direction and velocity. The preliminary canopy checks are important, so important that the jumper's ability to follow instructions is recorded, including his reactions to the coaching he has received from the instructor. The same system of instruction is followed on the timber jump, which simulates an actual fire jump. Here too, if the jumper lands in a tree, he can practice with a long let down rope, which will be used many times in a season of smoke jumping. The slip jump requires the use of important principles of parachute control. Slipping increases the rate of descent and is used only to avoid ground hazards in a high wind. Even on his first jump, the trainee may be required to make a quick decision to keep away from the other fellow in the air. Being alert is the important requisite. Learn to think fast and react automatically. Be quick to follow instructions from the loudspeaker. Forest fires do not often break out in ideal locations for parachute jumping. Usually, every new fire will present a brand new jumping problem. Varying wind drifts between the airplane and the ground may upset the spotter's previous calculations, especially when concerned with the small landing spots usually found in densely timbered areas. After all, when the pilot has completed his job and after the spotter has selected the landing spot, the rest of the trip to the fire is in the hands of the individual jumper. When he leaves the airplane, he is in every sense strictly on his own. The smoke jumper's parachute is maneuverable and the steering principles are not difficult to understand providing the trainee learns the purpose of the canopy steering slots, now seen when the chute is inflated. From a rear view, notice the normal counteracting action of the air flow through these openings. The air jetting through the slots stabilizes the canopy, holding it on an even keel in a normal descent. At the same time, the air escaping through the openings gives the jumper a forward speed of about four miles per hour, with slots always functioning from the rear. Of all these suspension lines, only two are directly connected with the steering slots and control their function. They are called guide lines. This outside line attached to the right front riser is the guide line controlling the right slot, while the outside line on the left front riser controls the left canopy slot. To illustrate, in making a right turn, the jumper pulls the right guide line, 
which inverts the lip of the right slot. This changes the course of the air flow so that both slots are jetting air in the same direction, the force pushing the canopy around right or clockwise. Naturally, the jumper turns with the canopy, therefore changing the direction of his forward speed. The turning canopy stops immediately at any time when the jumper releases the guide line and the airflow resumes normal action. The left turn is accomplished in the same manner. A pull on the left guide line inverts the left slot. The airflow through both openings is now directional to the left, turning the canopy left or counterclockwise. A 360 degree turn is completed in six to eight seconds or fast enough for a complete turn near the ground. Canopy turns are used on every jump. New men cannot start too soon to practice on turns. Pull the guideline and feel the reaction from the canopy. The slots are installed for a purpose. Smoke jumpers will experience erratic wind conditions in this typical mountainous forested country. Strong directional winds may blow at the upper levels, while calm air prevails in the sheltered valleys. The ideal condition, which some jumpers will experience a few times during a fire season, is an early morning jump in calm air to an alpine meadow surrounded by timber. The maneuver for this jump is shown by a zigzag pattern directly over the landing spot. It could also be a spiral jump, which is executed by holding down one guideline and controlling the turns directly over the target. In either case, the jumper should leave the airplane directly over the landing spot. Then maneuver back and forth or in a spiral to offset the forward speed of the canopy. He should turn and face the target on the final approach for an accurate landing. Most often, however, fire jumps are made under moderate wind conditions or in enough wind for landing areas to have a windward side and a downwind side, similar to conditions on a forest fire. Under such conditions, the point of takeoff from the airplane should offset the drift. Also, the jump pattern should confine all maneuvering to the windward side, all the way from the airplane to the landing spot. Just drifting along with the wind may result in a long hike back to the fire. For example, against a five mile wind, the takeoff point should offset a five mile drift. The jumper will maneuver a zigzag course on the windward side. While estimating the altitude and distance from the target at every turn. Until the last approach when he turns and faces the target coming in for a landing on the upwind side. A spotter will release the jumper even further into the wind to offset a 10 mile drift. After the canopy opens, the jumper should turn into the wind to use the canopy's forward speed against the drift. And if the drift is steady, he should face it all the way until it is time to turn towards the target for landing, coming in on the windward side. Wind velocity may change quickly between the airplane takeoff point and the landing area. This may happen in spite of the fact that the spotter's drift chute successfully forecasts the drift about 85% of the time. Be alert against changing winds. Keep estimating the height and distance from the landing spot at all times. It's the best safeguard. Slip jumps are rarely used except an excessive wind when faster descent is needed to avoid a dangerous landing.
training for a slip begins at 2,000 feet, or a safe height which will allow the trainee ample opportunity for practice. To start the maneuver, the jumper grasps three or four suspension lines and pulls them down hand over hand. He watches the canopy to be sure it revolves at the same rate of speed as he is turning. If it turns faster or slower, he should release the slip immediately. The canopy should be pulled down until the front perimeter is about eight feet above the jumper. The lines should not be wrapped around the arms or hands. They should hang free below and away from the body. Never hold a slip longer than 10 seconds. To release a slip, hold the lines in this manner, away from the body. Let the lines out slowly. Remember, they may foul around the legs or arms, so be careful. Never pull a slip jump under 500 feet. Pulling down the front risers is called planing. This maneuver increases the jumper's forward speed. With palms down, Press the front risers downward until the suspension lines stretch and streamline the front perimeter of the canopy. The action spills the air out behind and gives the canopy a forward tilt. The maneuver is a common one and used often to stretch a glide to the landing spot. Never plane clear to the ground. A practice timber jump simulates an actual timber jump on a fire. On about 30% of all fire jumps, the canopies hang up in trees, from which they are later removed after the fires are out. Practice timber jumps give the new men experience in rope let down from trees. Here they also receive instructions in canopy retrieving. After the rope is securely attached and the jumper has released himself from the harness, he carefully works his way down using the branches without completely releasing the rope. Always use the rope for a letdown when the lower branches are more than 10 feet above the ground. The procedure adopted for retrieving the canopy is not difficult to follow. First, the letdown belt is removed from the jumper's backpack tray and used as a climber's belt. The end of a rope becomes a safety strap. And this hip pocket size pruning saw is essential for removing branches in tight quarters. Tree climbers are used whenever they are necessary. All jumpers will receive instructions in climbing, how to put tree climbers on and how to use them effectively. It is not as easy as it appears. The retriever should remember that he is wearing sharp spurs when working his way between the branches. Injuries need not happen, providing the climber is careful to avoid hazards such as rotten branches, hard knots, and loose bark. The letdown rope left by the jumper is also used for retrieving. By holding the rope taut, a helper can pull the canopy away from the branches as they are removed. Lines should never be cut unless absolutely necessary, and damage to the canopy should be avoided. With canopy and lines extended, shake out all leaves, twigs, and other debris so the canopy is clean. Start the roll at the apex, leaving the apex out. And while folding the silk, keep it off the ground as much as possible. The lines are chained full length and later wrapped around the bundle. The apex goes into the sack last. It should be the first section of the canopy removed from the sack when it comes time for repacking. Retrieving is not difficult if this simple procedure is followed. Transportation is keeping pace with the present development of the smoke jumper project. Faster airplanes with greater load capacity are pressed into service to carry more men to the larger fires. Firefighting equipment for 22 jumpers is included in the one airplane load. Cargo can be dropped in larger quantity and with greater speed than heretofore. Using an intercommunication system, the spotter directs the pilot over the landing area from his position on the floor beside the open door. 
spaced at one second intervals, up to six jumpers can leave the airplane on one run over the landing area without being scattered too widely. Usually, the descending jumpers must maneuver to small clearings selected by the spotter as being most conveniently located near the fire. Here, the jumpers will establish a fire camp to which firefighting equipment and supplies will be dropped from the airplane. This is an important part of the training program. Here, new students have the opportunity to associate jumping with actual firefighting conditions. The basic rules for parachute jumping adopted by the Forest Service have been listed in this picture. The important factors essential to the safety of all jumpers have been reviewed briefly. There are many more. Actually, the jumper's training does not end here on the practice field. Each new fire jump will broaden the trainee's conception of safe parachute jumping. Every new jump will challenge his skill and his ability to work with others. Every jumper should realize that expert guidance must be limited on fire. He must rely on his own and have the know-how so urgently needed during the fire season. Practice the basic rules on the training field and on fire jumps. Leave the airplane in a vertical position. It's good insurance against severe opening shock. Inspect your canopy after it opens. Safeguard you will respect. Face your landing spot. Then estimate where the wind will take you. Plan your maneuvers on the windward side against a drift. And keep a safe distance from your fellow travelers while executing the turns. This picture has served an important need if by its showing it has explained the purpose of the canopy steering slots. After all, the ground coach and his loudspeaker will not be with you on fire jumps, so rely on your own ability to use the guidelines. to turn the canopy around against a wind drift or with a wind drift. To change the direction of your forward speed and to face the landing spot after leaving the airplane and before landing, fully utilize the minute and a half jumping time from the airplane to the ground. Learn to be your own judge. Don't wait to be told. Plane whenever it is necessary to increase forward speed. And always remember, your feet together and roll on landing. If you remember and follow the basic rules, you will arrive safely, ready for the job ahead. <laughs>